Well, good morning again. Are you still glad you're here in the house of the Lord? Isn't it a great day to be in His house? You could argue that any day we gather together in the name of the Lord is a great and wonderful day, isn't it? Shouldn't that be every day? All the time? Well, I can say that it is a joy and a pleasure that, that you're here and that I have an opportunity to stand before you and bring a message from God. And I just hope that I don't get in God's way as we uh, look at what He has for us today. And before I go any further, I want to say, by looking at each one of you in the eye, I love you. And I hope you know that. God loved me first, and He loved you. So who am I not to do the same to all of you? So I want you to know I love you. Well, it's strange we're not in the book of Hosea this week. We've been in there for so long, I, I, I put the message together and I kept going back going, wait a minute, this is different. This is different. Well, how many of you here by show of hands this morning have found yourself facing a trial or temptation in your life? Anybody who didn't raise your hand will be praying for you, okay? <laughs> I wasn't going to call you a liar, but you know, someone else did it for me. <laughs> I think if we're all being honest with ourselves, we can all say that we face them from time to time in our lives, and we may be facing them right now. They're, they're, you know, with, a, with a, a group of people this size, I think it's very safe to say that there are people in here right now that are going through some trials. And, and the real question that often arises is, why me? Why am I being challenged with this speed bump in my life's pathway at this time and this place, right? Isn't that a, isn't that a question we often ask? Perhaps you feel overwhelmed and struggle with the thought that life is unfair to you and anything that can go wrong seems to go wrong, doesn't it? And we stop oftentimes and we assess how things unravel in our life. And if we truly consider the actions and reactions that led to this, we conclude that it was of our own doings, don't we? You know, it's, it's quick when we, when we first react, we, we can say, this isn't fair. But if we stop and we reflect back, we can say, you know what? I had a part in this. I had a place in this. In most cases. That's not always the case because there are times when God chooses to put a speed bump in our road because He's growing us. And that happens. You know, and so, you know, things that happen can include someone we pur purposely plotting to do evil against you. Someone that's out there going, well, that goody two, two, two shoes, I'm going to show him and I'm going to do something to... To, to thwart his good fortune. It could be, you know, an adversary out there that you did something to that you weren't even aware of. You know, we see road rage all the time, don't we? Out there, people. And most of the time, the people that are having road rage against them, they didn't even know what they did. You know, and there are, there are exceptions to that. But maybe there's a form of sickness or a disease or a loss of a job. What happened? I had this great job I was providing for my family and now it's all gone. What happened? Well, whatever the circumstances, we can take comfort in the fact that God can take every event. Are you hearing this? He can take every single event in our lives, even the things that others intend for evil against us, and He can turn them into good. Did you know that? He does that. We see that all throughout God's Word, how He's done that. You know, one of the first biblical accounts of this happening we find in Genesis. You remember Joseph? Joseph's brothers took him and sold him into slavery. They wanted him out of the place. They wanted him gone. In fact, they took his, his uh, clothing and they spread blood on it and they took it to their dad and said, he's dead. He's gone. He's not around. And they intended evil for it. And what did God intend? What did God take that and do? He turned it into a tremendous blessing and actually it came back on that family and because of that, they survived a horrific famine that would have probably taken their lives or at least some of the family members' lives as a result. You know, so, so God can take what others intend for evil and He can turn it in for good. And He does that time and time again. In our passage today in Psalm 3 that Karen just read for us, we hear the words of David lifted up to God in a time when many of the people that David was anointed as king to serve on and to lead over had turned their backs on Him. In fact, it went even deeper than that. It went into his family. His family, his son, Absalom, was leading the rebellion. He wanted to have his father killed so he could assume the throne. And he had convinced other people to come along with him. Well, 
Guess what? David understood God and who God is and how God takes things and makes it work. And today, I would like us to look more deeply into the words of David, specifically in this psalm. And I want us to learn from this what faith, a triumphant faith, really looks like and how we can apply this triumphant faith to our own lives and truly have victory over our adversaries. So will you please pause with me here once again and let's lift this up to God that He would reveal to us His truths through this passage. Father, when we see You at work, it just amazes me how You can take any situation and turn it into good for Your glory. Father, You're an amazing God. And You love us. And You take our faults and You take our angers and You take our sins and you turn them into something that is, is incredible. We're so unworthy. Father, help us to be mindful of this, and may our hearts change that instead of wanting to be that way, that we seek to do your will for others and seek to turn the evil they face into good for your glory. And may we be a light to this world here in Nampa and to the ends of the world. And we're going to give you the glory and the praise in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the Bible teaches us that David was uh, a man after God's own heart. That's what it tells us. And this was despite the fact of the many sins and failures and poor decisions that he made throughout his life. You see, like David, we lose our way sometimes, don't we? And certainly he wasn't an exception. You know, what's amazing to me is when I read the Bible and I read about the the people from the past, I'm amazed that God shares all of the warts and all of the scars because He wants us to realize that it's not about us. It's not about a man. It's not about the greatness of someone. It's about God taking what is imperfect and applying His perfections to it. You know, and that's what, what is amazing. And, and you know, with David at times, he found himself placing his needs and desires above God's plans for his life, didn't he? He forgot who made everything in his life possible and he placed him in the position as king over the nation of Israel. He forgot all of that. And he start to, started to think a little bit more of himself than he ought to. In fact, in one account, probably the most famous account, we see where David held back. He didn't go out with his troops to battle. And he stayed back and he just kind of looked over the kingdom and, and kind of just was lazy. And as a result of that, it led to an illicit relationship with a, with a woman who was married. I mean, the, the relationship itself was bad enough, but then it was married. And then he didn't stop there. To cover up his tracks, he had her husband killed in battle. Now, we, think, we look at that and we go, how horrible is that? But folks, think about your own sin in your life, in your past. How many times have you sought to do things to cover that up? Because you didn't want anybody else to find out about it. We've got to be careful when we point a finger that when we point it out there, there's three pointing back at us. And we have to be mindful of that. But you know what? Once David's sin was exposed, he fell down and confessed it all and said, do with me what you will. And God said, uh-uh, I've got more plans for you. And he turned back to God fully. Now, there were consequences for his sin. There was definitely consequences. And one of the consequences was there was strife among his family. And one of the things that was part of that strife was his son Absalom. Right? He was a rebellious son. In fact, he burned a barley field to gain attention. Right? You ever, had a, you ever seen teenagers out there that go out and do things, break windows and do stuff? They're clamoring for attention. They're clamoring for attention. And that's exactly what Absalom was doing. Well, when he didn't get the attention he thought he deserved, he took it a step further and he pursued David and wanted to have him killed. And, you know, that's what came as a result of David's ultimate sin, which, which cascaded into all of these things. So in this psalm, we see David's response to the trial in his life. And his, it was, his response was this, to turn to God with absolute trust knowing that this was the only sure formula of finding victory over the adversaries. And the first thing we see David demonstrate is that true faith acknowledges that God is greater than all our adversaries. Look with me again at verse 1. It says, O Lord, how many are my foes? 
Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation from Him in God. Notice in these two verses, we see the word many called out by David three times. He was trying to emphasize that there weren't just a few people in the kingdom that were turning against him. There were many who were choosing to follow Absalom and overthrow him. And so it was a large contingency of people who were seeking to have him permanently removed from office and not just some small little, you know, corner activity going on. This was a big deal. And this time in history for the nation of Israel was actually rather peaceful. The, the, the surrounding countries weren't providing for them threats like they had throughout all of the history leading up to this. This was a rather peaceful time for them. And so they should have been enjoying that peace and instead in David's case the peace was gone not from neighboring nations but from his own family his own people that he was leading it was an internal thing and so when he should have been free from worry and fear he found himself in the crosshairs of the people in a situation that seemed to be growing worse by the day well at the end of verse 2 we see the people beginning to think that God, they declared that God had turned from David and was no longer supporting his kingship over the nation. There, when they said there is no salvation for him in God, their statement there was to say, God's not on his side anymore. God's turned away, just like he did with the previous King Saul. But notice his response to the situation. On the surface, when you read these verses, you may be tempted to immediately think that David is simply crying out in desperation over the situation. Perhaps he lamented and, and was feeling sorry for himself over the rising number of people who were turning against him and the grave situation that he was facing. But don't miss this fact. This is something we can learn and apply in our lives. His immediate response was to take the situation and lift it up to God. You see how he did that? He didn't say, I'm going to go buy my way out of this or I'm going to go use my power and, and, and usurp it over the people. No, he took the situation and he immediately lifted it up to God. And so that is so important that we learn that. That should be our very first response to anything when the road turns or there's a bump in the road that we stop and we lift it up to God. He's already aware of the situation, but he wants to make sure you are aware of the situation. So we need to lift it up to Him. And so it's, it's very important. Now, Karen alluded to it, and I want to call it out now. You'll see in the psalm the use of the word selah. Okay? It's not 100% understood what it meant, but it is believed to be a musical term that's represented as a pause or a crescendo. It's supposed to be stop and reflect on what I just said and prepare for what I'm about to say. Think about it. Don't just read through it blindly and keep going and say, oh, that's nice, that's good. No, stop and think about what it is you just heard and prepare for what you're about to hear. And that's what we believe that it means. And so David included these pauses for that very purpose. You guys realize how serious the situation is I'm facing. God, I'm lifting it up to you. This is terrible. They want to kill me. Because that's how they overthrew the kings in that time, they didn't simply just take them and say, okay, you're no longer king and we'll you know, elect somebody else or do something else. No, no. It, it, it included a loss of life in, in most cases. What a message for us today. What is your first response when something goes wrong? What is that first response? Do you lash out in, in anger and, and bitterness and, and tear upon the people around you? That's a pretty common thing. I struggle with that. I'm going to be honest with you. You can ask my wife. I've got some room for growth there too. Do we fall apart and give up in defeat? Or like some of you, and, and this is the thing that I used to really, really struggle with because I'm an engineer. I want to fix it. I'm going to fix it, man. There's a problem here. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to take care of this situation. I'm going to put it away and it'll never be an issue again doesn't work out very well, let me tell you from first hand. Or do you, like David, acknowledge the severity of the situation, lay it before God, and seek His guidance and His direction? Sometimes that's not so easy, is it? 
It's been my experience, both personally and having spoken with many in the context of a pastor, that all too often we fall into the other categories than the last one. Our first response all too often isn't to turn to God first. And you know what the tendency is? We go through all of this pain, all of this agony, all of this suffering, and then come to the conclusion at the end of all of that that it's too big for us. And so in exasperation, we say, I can't do it. I guess I better lift it up to God. Folks, what's wrong with that equation? What's wrong with the order in which we're putting these things? Think of all that suffering and pain you've gone through that you didn't have to go through. You wasted all that time that you'll never get back. Folks, the last time I checked, when a minute's gone, I can't go back and get that minute. It's gone. So what are you going to do with the time that you've got? Do you turn to Him first? You see, that doesn't mean we shouldn't take inventory of the situation. That doesn't mean we should, shouldn't stop and say, you know what, look at what's in front of me and let me understand the whole thing as it's laid out there. But it does mean once we understand it, that we lift it up to Him and we say, look God, no matter how small or how great, I still can't handle this situation even though I think I can. It's up to you. Because if I handle it, and I may think I've handled it, I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to mess it up, and I'm going to put myself in a place where I didn't want to be, and then God's really going to have to intercede to clean up that mess. So much worse. You know, look what David didn't do. He didn't say, this is futile. There's no hope. I give up. You know? But what he does say in essence is, God, this is really bad. My enemies are growing larger and they want to kill me and they want to seize power. Yet I know that you alone will determine the outcome of the situation. Nothing can happen outside of your will and you will use it somehow for your glory. And so I lay this at your feet and I will accept whatever course you decide to take in this situation. Because you know what, guys? We have to accept the fact that God's solution to our problems aren't our solutions. And so just because we think we know how things should turn out doesn't mean that's the right way. We have to be okay with what God says is the solution to the situation. And when we do that, we'll start to see how He works for good. Is your faith at a point where you're able to immediately take your trials and tribulations before the throne of God? Can you lay them at His feet and let Him deal with it? This is the first step we must take to overcome our adversaries. True faith acknowledges that God is greater than all of our adversaries. Next, David David shows us this. True faith concedes that our protection comes from God. Look at verse 3. It says, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and He answered me from His holy hill. After acknowledging that God is greater than his enemies and laying his circumstances before God, David then declared his confidence in God's protection over his adversaries. In other words, David didn't tell God that he believed in his ability to deal with the situation and then attempt to take matters into his own hands. David was known as a mighty warrior. He was known as a great battle warrior. Remember in the time of Saul, they talked about David killed tens of thousands while Saul killed thousands. And this caused jealousy with Saul, but the point was that David was known as a great battle person. And throughout the kingdom, his superior battle skills were well known. But notice, however, that in his current situation, David realized that his only skills, talents, and abilities were not going to count here. They were not going to cause him to be victorious. He knew immediately that any victory he would experience began with God's protection and guidance. This was evident throughout David's life, even when he went to battle. I'll give you a specific example. When he battled the Philistines, the very first time he battled the Philistines as king, he got on his knees and he said, God, do I go to battle with them or do I not? You tell me. And God says, go to battle with them and I will bring victory. And he did. Now, several years later, another battle ensued with those very same Philistines. And you know what David did? He didn't say, 
God was with me last time. He showed me the battle plan. I'm going to go do it. No problem. He fell on his knees and he said, God, do I go to battle with him? And if I do, how do I go about it? And you know what God told him? Don't do it like you did last time. Go around behind him. Flank him and I'll bring victory. But if he had done it his own way, what do you think would have happened? David knew that no victory would ever come outside of God's declaration, His plan, and His perfect timing. And so he relied on that. And we can learn from this. And we can acknowledge that God is greater than our adversaries and lay those things at His feet. But the problem comes we do that. We're, we're okay with that. Up to that point, we're okay. Pastor, I do that. I lay it at his feet, and, I, and, and, and it's really good. But what do we do? An hour or a day later, we come back and we pick it up and say, well, you know, God's too busy right now. He hasn't answered it immediately, so I'm going to take it, and I'm going to go take care of it now because, God, I'm sorry I bothered you with this. Nobody's ever done that here, have they? Never done that, right? Huh. We laugh. But the reality is, if our faith is true, we must realize that retrieving that which we've laid before the throne of God is wrong. What does that reflect about our faith? Do you really trust Him or do you say you trust Him? What do your actions say? We've got to resist the temptation of thinking that just because God doesn't deal with the situation immediately or in our time or in our way that he is in, uninterested in what it is we've brought before him because he told us. He said, bring your cares, your concerns, your hurts, your ills. Lay them before me. I want them. Now, do you think a God who asks for things like that is simply going to say after that, don't bother me with your petty problems. That's not the God that I serve. That's not who he is. He wants everything. True faith concedes that our protection comes from God. The third thing we learn from David is that true faith brings true peace. Verse 5, I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Now, Let's quickly review here what we've seen from David. He called out the severity of his problem and he laid them at God's feet. He acknowledged his own weaknesses and inabilities to deal with the situation using his own strength. Instead, he chose to rely on God for protection from his enemies and deliverance from this serious situation. Now, having done that, David now demonstrated that he was at total peace with the situation. He didn't just say it. He didn't lay it at God's feet and then say, Oh my, what's going to happen? Oh, I don't know. I just... Um, yeah. I'm going to lay up awake at night going, how's this going to get resolved? David's very life, these people were pursuing him. They were, they were within a stone's throw from him. And you know what he did that night? He slept. He slept peacefully. What does that reflect about his character? He said he trusted God. Did he really trust Him? Absolutely. 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 Now, let's bring it up here into the year 2018. Problems come your way. You lay it before God's throne. How well do you sleep at night? Pastor, you're getting a little personal. We need to think about that. We need to challenge our faith, don't we? We need to ask ourselves, why am I worrying about this? What good does one minute, one hour, or one night of worry do about a situation? How does that contribute to solving the situation? Somebody, somebody tell me. Somebody tell me how many people in here, show of hands, have solved their problems by laying awake at night and worrying and tossing and turning? Nobody's going to take that one, huh? We need to think about that. You see, we, like David need to be at total peace with the situation. If we do everything according to what God tells us to do when we're faced with a problem, then it's handled. It's handled. It's under control. Don't stress over it. 
Our adversaries don't stand a chance unless God allows it. You see, here's the thing we have to understand. Nothing is going to happen to you outside of God's knowledge and His will. Do you understand that? This very attitude that the Apostle Paul demonstrated when he communicated in his letter to the church at Philippi. Do you remember there was a time when Paul wrote to the church at Philippi? You know where Paul was at the time he wrote that? He was chained up in prison. Chained up in prison. Now, if, he had, if anybody had a reason to worry and, 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 and be concerned, don't you think it was Paul? They were, they were looking to wipe out all those Christians. It's time we take and make an make a example out of them so they quit making a, a stir around here. We're going to have them beheaded or crucified or whatever, right? Look at the people that came before Paul. If anybody had a reason to worry, look what Paul had to say in Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. Here's what he said. He said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And here it is. Are you ready? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Have you ever gone through a situation where the storms were blowing hard, things were going wrong, and you had a peace? I have. There's times when I haven't because I haven't done it right, but I have. I've shared this with many of you before, but I'll, I think it bears sharing. My daughter, we got the news, not just that she had cancer, but this was the second time. It was back. I got the news. I was at work. I was working over here. At that time, Micron had a plant over here in Nampa, and I got the, got the news as I pulled out of the parking lot or as I was about to pull out of the parking lot. Fortunately, there was nobody behind me because I put my car in park and I cried. And I said, God, I can't deal with this. I can't fix this. I can't buy a solution for this. This is yours. And you know what came out of that? The most incredible peace that I can't explain. And I remember from that day forward, I had a piece about this that people came up to me and they would, they would, oh, you must be going through such turmoil. You must be suffering so bad. And I could look them in the eye and say, I'm at peace with this. God has this under control. It's out of my hands. It's because I did it right. Now, why don't I keep doing it right? Well, that's another story. That's a whole other sermon. Are you able to do that? Are you able to look in the midst of the storm and say, I'm at peace. I can't explain it, but I'm at peace. Have you taken inventory of the situations that you're facing in life and have you laid them at the foot of the throne and have you left them there? Are you relying on God's protection and strength and not on your own to overcome and defeat your advers adversaries? Are you refusing to rely on your own strength and acknowledge the situation is just too big for you? Until you follow God's will in dealing with trials and tribulations, you will not fully experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. You see, no amount of alcohol, no amount of drugs, no relationships, no self-help programs, or material possessions will provide you a means that brings peace in the midst of the storm. Please listen to me when I say this. Selah. You don't have to suffer and spend countless sleepless nights because of life's trials and tribulations. You don't have to be that person. In fact, it's time we stop letting circumstances and the attacks from the enemy steal our joy and prevent us from having peace. We can have victory. We have it right here. He's told us how to do it. So let's put it into practice. God isn't just telling us something to try and make us feel better and patting us on the back and saying, it'll be okay. It is truly possible to have peace in the midst of the storm, and we miss out on it far too much, folks. We suffer way too much. God never intended for us to suffer in that manner. He wants us to lay it at His feet, to trust fully in Him, 
and allow His peace, which surpasses all understanding, to fill our lives and bring us joy when joy should not be present. Recognize and start experiencing the truth that true faith brings true peace. Finally, David shows us in this passage that true faith petitions God for deliverance. Verse 7, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God! For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Once we've acknowledged and enumerated our problems and acknowledged that God is our only true source of resolution, we need to take the issue to Him. Take it to Him. Lift it up. Share with Him what you want. Share your heart. That doesn't mean He's going to answer the way you want it done, but it's okay to share your heart. Get it out before Him. He wants you to do that. That's so important. David, in a final submissive but acknowledging plea, he lifts up his petition to God in these final two verses and he declares to God that he is depending fully on Him to deliver victory over his enemies. Notice what he doesn't say. God, I'm sorry to burden you with my trouble, so you know, please don't let me interrupt what you're doing. It's not what he says at all. He knows that God is waiting for us to bring our needs and petitions to Him. Look at what the Apostle Peter had to say about this. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Here's what Peter said. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Here it is, verse 7. Casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. God cares for you. Cast your burdens and anxieties on Him. Despite what many people say about God today, He is not too busy for our problems. Small things do matter to Him. Anything. We just read it. He cares for you. He earnestly desires for you to have a life filled with joy, with peace that passes understanding. If He didn't, then why did He send His Son to die on a cross? How can God love us so much to send His Son and then not care about us after that and walk away? That just doesn't fit with His character. It doesn't fit with who He is. Now folks, let's be honest with ourselves. Why would you trust God with your eternal destination You'll place your trust in Christ. You'll say, I'm placing that. My eternity will be spent with Him in heaven because I put my faith in Him. Why you would place your trust in something that significant and then refuse to trust Him for your day-to-day -day issues. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Don't let this world fill your head with lies that don't come from God's Word. Don't read anything into God's Word that isn't there. That's one of our biggest problems. we got people standing behind these pulpits telling you lies because they've read something into the text. Folks, read it for what it is. Read it for what it is. Don't assume or don't take man's logic and say, okay, well, do, 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 do. oh, here it is. We can sin all we want and we don't have to worry. That's Oscar Mayer theology. A bunch of baloney. Give God the opportunity to deliver you from your adversaries. True faith petitions God for deliverance. Well, does that resonate with anybody here today? Are you in the midst of a trial or are you facing an adversary that seems overwhelming? Something that's causing you great anxiety and lost sleep at night? King David just showed us in this psalm that we don't have to suffer these things in times of trouble. Faith, true faith in God is the answer. In this, we see that true faith acknowledges that God is greater than all our adversaries. True faith concedes that our protection comes from God. True faith brings true peace. And true faith petitions God for our deliverance. Believer, are you here today and suffering unnecessarily from life's problems? Should I put a sila in there? 
Let me first encourage you that you just saw the solution to your problems. If you'll follow these things, these examples that David set, then you're on a pathway that will take those anxieties and those sleepless nights out of your future. Have you acknowledged to God that He alone has the power to protect and deliver you from your situation? And have you left it at the throne and refused to go and pick it back up? Let God have full access to your life. Begin living the way He wants you to live and experience Him fully. Non-believer, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Let's start with the bad news. None of this that I've spoken about today is possible in your life in the current situation. Without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, these things cannot take place within you. On our own, we will always fall short. And in our own power, we have one guarantee, failure. That's the bad news. Now the good news. Surrender your life to Christ and all of this becomes immediately possible in your life. God's offering you a gift right here. There's a gift. But that gift is not yours and can't be realized and enjoyed unless you first accept it. You have to come and accept it. In order to do that, in order to say, I want that gift, you have to acknowledge, you know what, I need that gift. I'm a sinner. I can't pay the penalty for my sins that would reconcile me to God. All I can do is suffer the penalty of death that, that God's Word declares on sin. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough toys. I don't have enough things. I don't have enough time to pay off that debt myself. But the good news is Jesus already paid it all. He paid it. He paid it on the cross. It's free to you. It cost Him everything, but it's free to you. And you can enjoy the peace that passes understanding that we talked about here today. So if you want to find out what it takes to accept that gift, don't leave here today without coming and talking to me. You can do it this very day, this, this very moment. You don't have to pull your wallets out. You don't have to do anything special. You don't have to make any special incantations or chants. You just simply have to acknowledge, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and I accept the one and only true Savior, Jesus Christ. So come and talk to me. Let me share that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your words from David. Thank you for the example in David's life that he trusted in you and to show us how he trusted in you. And then we see the outcome. And Lord, it was all for your glory. Lord, it's amazing how you can take the evil in our lives and turn it into your good. We're so grateful to you for everything. And so Father, I pray that these words today would penetrate our hearts, our minds, and begin to take action in our lives so that we could reflect the glory of Jesus Christ in Nampa and to the ends of the world. And may you be pleased. And we're going to give you the glory in Christ's precious name and all God's people said. Amen.